Okay. I forgot to unmute. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today, our final webinar of the fall. And today we have Dr. Justin Jennings from uh, University of Toronto and the Royal Ontario Museum. But before we begin, I just wanted to do a land acknowledgement. So while we're meeting on a virtual platform today, we would like to acknowledge the importance of the land which we each call home. So from coast to coast, we acknowledge the unceded and ancest ancestral territory of the Inuit, Métis and First Nations people that call this land home. So I'm going to pass over to Amadeo, who's going to be introducing our speaker for today. Hello, everyone, and uh, I'm glad to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Justin Jennings, who is the curator of Latin American archaeology at the Royal Ontario Museum. And uh, he is also an, an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Toronto. And uh, after obtaining a bachelor's degree in classical ar archaeology, he turned his research focus to, to Peruvian archaeology, completing a master's degree and a PhD at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And uh, now his research focuses on social, political and economic changes associated with the expansion of state formations like the Wari and the Inca in the pre-Hispanic Andes. And uh, Dr. Jennings is currently conducting fieldwork in Southern Peru, where the site of Quilcapampa is located. And uh, a book about the excavations conducted at the site will be published uh, next year. And today, Dr. Jennings will present us some of the results of this project. Well, uh, thank you, Emilio, for that uh, introduction. Um, and. Uh, it's actually, um, funnily enough, it's actually true. We've actually got a project going on right now in Arequipa with my longtime colleague, Willie Epes, um, in a place called Pampacolca. So even though I'm, I'm virtual, we're very excited about some of the field work we're actually doing in, in 2020, since it's such a, a tough thing to do. Um, but um, yeah, today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about the, about the IU. And um, let me see if I can find it here. Where is this presentation? Here you are. So um, hopefully everyone can, can see this. And uh, so rethinking the IU and its origins. Um, let me see, how do I advance this? Oh, oh there it is, okay. And uh, before I begin, I just want to give a nod to all of uh, my collaborators uh, Willie, I talked about Stephanie, Beth, Tiffany, Alexa. I won't read the long list of folks that have been part of these projects. Uh, and Madeo uh, mentioned a book that we have coming out in, I believe it's May, on the site of Cocobamba that'll talk about the Middle Rise component. We have another article coming out in Latin American Antiquity about the later meteor period component. So I'll be talking a little bit about some of those findings and also pushing some of those findings. Um, a bit further in a different direction than I have with my, my colleagues. So, you know, I, I uh, you know, thank them very much for all the work, great work that we've done together, but also uh, if you don't agree with some of the ideas that I put forward, uh, you know, don't blame my collaborators because I'm, I'm uh, probably pushing this uh, a few bridges too far in terms of some of the thoughts about the IU. Um, so to begin here, uh, the, the IU has many different def definitions, but let's just um, use this one for today, which is a land-owning social unit defined by kinship regulated by an ethic uh, uh, of co cooperation, okay? So um, what's an IU? An IU is political, economic, and ritual. Um, they're based on shared ancestry, centered on mutual aid, so centered on reciprocity. Uh, they're ranked vis-a-vis um, -vis each other, oftentimes in opposition to each other and internally egalitarian. And, so, and as you see in that parentheses, and last point, um, this is not to say that um, everyone is equal in terms of what they have, but the idea is if you have more than other people, you better justify it uh, within that IU. You don't need to justify it so much to, to outsiders. Um, okay, so that's the, the, the basic notion of an IU. Um, and, IU organization is seen throughout the central Andes, throughout much of the Andes, 
Uh, here's a, a beautiful image from Catherine Allen uh, showing some folks, uh, members of Mayu, about to go out to the Koyaritia uh, sort of ritual pilgrimage. But for those that uh, study in the Andes, they know that traditionally um, that the, that this kind of ethnic unit tied to land, tied to ethnicity is at the core of a lot of interactions um, at the village level and beyond. And um, for those that study Andean archeology, span we know that uh, looking at things like Wamampomo, that um, in the Inca period into the, at least the very uh, end of the Late Maria period, it's very clear that similar kinds of IU organizations structured life uh, right around at least the time of the Inca conquest and certainly at the time of the Spanish conquest. Now, I'm gonna be in dialogue here as in part with the 1997 book called Mummies and Mortuary Monuments by William Isbell. Um, there aren't a lot of books that really shake things up in Andean archeology, span but this was one of them. And basically it was, it was an attack against this sort of low Andino idea, similar idea, similar sort of concepts in Mesoamerica and other places of saying, hey, look, you know, uh, people were arguing that the IU was this fundamental building block for Indian society. It was, you know, it is now, it was at the time of the Spanish, it was at the time of Inca, and it was, you know, all the way deep into the past. So they were projecting the IU all the way back. And what Isabel had to say in this book was basically, no, this is something that developed um, in uh, early, late, in, very late and early intermediate periods. So 500, 400 AD spread during this middle horizon period and was a, uh, was, was a means to sort of push against state formation and egalitarian society, uh, sorry, uh, more high role societies. So this was his idea that I use saying, hey, look, this is not from time immemorial, this comes from a spe specific uh, place, a specific time, and then spreads across the Andes. Okay. Um, what I'm gonna do is engage with some of these ideas about IU and how IUs form and how and what IUs are. Uh, especially in light of our own work in, the, in uh, the site of Kilcabamba. There you see that in the slide. Um, it's uh, fairly close to the city of Arequipa for those people that are um, that have been down in Peru. You see the inset map there of Peru. So I'll be going back and forth to the site of Kilcabamba. And this just provides you some of those site names are, are of particular interest, but gives you some sense if you've been in that region, some of the places around Kilcabamba. So, Here's what I'll do with this talk. I'll talk about how, how I use form, but I'll do that from, from not so much an Andean perspective. I'll talk about it cross-culturally, very generally, and actually give you a, an example from the Huron uh, locally here in the, in the Ontario area to talk about IU-like formations. Um, I'll also talk about the conditions when I use don't spread because um, there is a sense in the, um, in our literature and in the Isbell book and other things, we're sort of talking about uh, once you get IUs, they tend to spread sort of uh, very swiftly. And I'll say that that's not necessarily the case. Why they take time to develop. Another example, so I'll use two examples from Cocopampa. And then I'll talk about why rethinking IU emergence may matter to our sort of thoughts about Andean archaeology and general women and the sort of broad uh, scope of changes in the Andes through time. Um, okay, so how do I use form? Um, so uh, an important thing, but perhaps a mundane point that I'll make is that I use writ large aren't unusual. Um, so what I mean by that is yes, the particulars of, of the, of I use in the end, particulars how central Indian um, uh, I use work, yes, are particular to that place. But the idea of a, of the idea of them is not unusual. And you see, for example, something fairly similar in the Aztec uh, Calpulis. Um, and we can give other examples from other places in the old world as well, that, that extended kin groups that hold land, help each other out and advance their interests against, against competitors is a very, very common reaction to certain conditions. And so what I do today is talk about some of those conditions and say that, hey, that, 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 that I use formed to solve a problem. And it's a fairly common problem that people face worldwide. Okay, and the problem that I that I think they're facing is one of settlement scaling, one of aggregation. Um, this is uh, 
sorry, the, the quality here is not very good, but you get the point. This is taught, this is coming from uh, Michael Smith's Wide Urban World blog, but it's talking about Ben Court and other people's work that basically looks at as, in this case, modern cities grow in size, they have some logarithmic qualities to it in terms of a gross domestic product, crime, income, patents, so innovation. So basically saying that as cities get bigger, they have these really big scalar effects in terms of all sorts of changes, both positive and negative. Okay, so as, 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 as settlements get bigger, things happen. And what Scott Ortman and some of the colleagues in this in this urban scaling project that's run out, I think it's it's ASU and has a number of different different members. They've looked at those kind of scaling properties and said, hey, look, these may be fairly universal. That when people settle into smaller areas, as cities get bigger, as valleys get more and more populated, you have these scalar effects. You have more and more disruption. You have more and more change, more and more innovation um, uh, that are going on. And people are trying to manage some of that stress. So <laughs> another, another poor quality slide here, but uh, you know, Michael Smith talks about this uh, he uses the term energized crowding, the idea that as people come together, uh, you start getting that change. You start getting people trying to navigate how best to live their lives, where before they didn't have so many issues because they just didn't have so many people making claims on resources, making claims on, on, um, on power or whatever it might be. Okay, so that's a sort of... Um, uh, scalar stress or settlement scaling, um, you know, conversation. So why do IU like social units form? So once again, drawing back from the particulars of the IU, but thinking about Kapulis, about other kinds of social units, how do they, why do they form? Well, they form, at least in my mind, um, because of the increasing de demands of increasing population aggregation. More people in more and more and in, in the same place creates a need um, to make decisions about um, resources and other and other things, and you know, once again, so this is in the spirit of in the spirit of uh, of uh, of doing a, a a webinar, you know, where I basically talk to myself up, upstairs in my in my attic, you know, I'll do a thing like point number two: people don't like change, right? You know, a broad uh, you know a broad a broad statement, but the, the the issue here is that is that folks are looking at at the changes that they, they're, 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 they're having to make. And oftentimes they're looking towards tradition, looking towards ways in which they did things before in order to solve the new problems of today. And a common strategy is to extend the family unit to encompass more and more people, is to use kinship as that tool to sort of scale up. So if you need to scale up resource making, if you scale up you know, your, 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 your group in order to make stronger claims to, um, to resources, what do you do? Well, you oftentimes lean on kinship because that's what you've leaned on before, okay? And that allows for that greater coordination. So then um, I use and I use like forms are something that tends to be reacting to fairly general scalar effects so that you would see an I use like organization occurring in many places as they begin to to uh, deal with aggregation. And I'm gonna give you an example, uh, you know, far away from the Andes, but, uh, you know, close to where I live here in Huron Longhouses. Um, here you hear, this is just the, uh, you know, gives you some sense of those different Iroquois speaking groups around the 15th century when you start seeing the longhouses, the longhouse settlements really expanding. Um, here is an example of one of these longhouses um, as they begin to develop the first longhouses. Something, some around 1200 AD, people begin to uh, settle into these into these more permanent longhouses. They get bigger and bigger over time. And what you see over time, this is 1400 to, uh, to, to 1600. This is uh, Jennifer Birch's uh, uh, some of her wonderful work uh, on 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 these issues. Uh, what you see is is that. The longhouse, as a sort of IU like extended, it's an extended uh, you know, kin group. These are matrilineal lines. They all live together in one longhouse. Those longhouses have certain claims to, to, to fields. 
they have certain claims when they go ahead and 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 uh, you know fight for other kinds of resources, other members of Longhouse. You can see that they're using this Longhouse as the fundamental social unit as they try to navigate larger and larger settlements. Okay. And at the same time, as they now as they navigate larger longhouse settlements and larger village identities vis-a-vis uh, -vis others that are outside the village or within this or di different clusters within the village. What they tend to do, what they start doing around um, the first evidence, is, but this, this is a, a, this, so this is around 1400, this is, you start to be getting a lot of aggregation, lots of tension, lots of scalar stress. Um, you see the Huron Feast of the Dead, right, which brings in first longhouse together, then whole villages, then confederacies, into a ceremony where you take the dead that have um, that have passed away over uh, the course of oftentimes a generation and put them together in a giant pit and then you mix those those ancestors together, right? Um, you you oftentimes uh, also destroy some of the wealth. All the things that are perhaps stopping you from thinking thinking in terms of a broader kin unit as, as a broader community you get rid of. So it's a ceremony that you're trying to push the collective over the individual. Just like the longhouse as a, as a agricultural feature is pushing the collective over the individual. Um, okay, so let's finally get into the Andes, uh, into, into section two of this, why I use don't spread. So a Kilkapamba example here. Uh, and unfortunately, um, I, I don't know what you see here, you know, half, some of my slides I can't see. So actually Kilkabamba is not, not in the slide that I can see, but it's off to off on the, the far side there. It's covered by uh, by everyone's name there. But um, it's in this broad, broad uh, um, sort of coastal plain. I'll be talking about the coastal plain, how people are living uh, in this in this coastal plain uh, around, let's say, circa um, <clears throat> Well, in, in, the, in the beginning of the first millennium BC, let's see the first half, first, first millennium BC and a little bit after. In Siwas, which is where Kilkopamba is located, Kilkopamba is that red dot there. Don't worry about all the other archeological sites. But what's intriguing for, for us today is that we don't have any early habitation sites in Siwas. We know they were there um, we, uh, because we find their cemeteries uh, down below all these all, all this area down below here is a fairly arid part. So what you were doing is hey, taking fairly um, small femoral sites that were almost certainly on the river bottom. They were burying their their folks there in the in in this area that was not um, that was not uh, habitable, and um, we know they were they were farming. We have maize and other sorts of things that they're leaving in those in those cemeteries. We just don't see them, but we can generalized about what life was like in this region from the from the southern coastal region of Peru in general from that uh, from that from that period in the beginning of the first millennium AD or and so here's a here's a site uh, uh, Cocoisca uh, excavated by uh, Verity Whalen um, the details of it aren't particularly of interest here but what you what, what's interesting to me are two points. This is from the Nazca Valley. It's fairly far away. I'll show you an image of it, but it's a great example of what villages were like in this region of Peru um, in, this, in this era. Uh, there's no big plaza. There's no sort of communal area that people are coming to at, at the village level. And if you look at those little dots in the picture, what, what those are, those are houses and, and external patios. And for the most part, you see just a bunch of individual houses uh, with their external patios. There's not extended household. There's not extended compounds. In it. There's nothing like a longhouse that brings a bunch of people together. The architecture from this era is about single family, nuclear family units that are individual on the landscape, okay? And the concern here, like I said, the, the, it's, it's not the best of evidence, but there's a, there's a sense here that the focus of life might be on the nuclear family rather than extended family, and perhaps rather on the IU. And we'll, we'll talk about this as we move forward. Okay, um, and here's an example from uh, Tumulaka Lechimba, Nicholas Sherrod's work. This is in Macagua, another part of Southern Peru. But once again, you don't see collective tombs. You don't see this emphasis. Remember I talked about the Huron, the Feast of the Dead, bringing people together. Um, 
you, you saw the, the, the focus on collective tombs and the IU from Bill Isbell's work, from, the, from Juan Manpomo's work. We don't see this in this era in, uh, in the Andes, uh, sorry, not in the Andes, in this part of Southern Peru, we see single cis burials, okay? Populations are generally fairly low. Uh, in, in much of this region, we see single cis burials, individual households. In short, we don't see a lot of evidence uh, clear evidence for IU formations. Could it have existed? Certainly. We don't have a lot of evidence on the ground for it. Okay, so let me take you then to the middle horizon. So uh, this is our first Cocopampa example. Cocopampa is a site that's found in the middle horizon. I'll tell you in a second. Um, I'll show you a second some pictures of that. Macagua, Nazca, Cocopampa, they're all on this sort of this part of southern Peru. Um, but then a very different kind of settlement shows up in the site of Wari, sometime around in the sixth century, um, this site starts metasizing into a into a settlement that maybe is maybe as large as uh, sixty thousand people um, at its height. There's another sister city called Conchapada, and the work that uh, that folks have done, including one Carlos Black, Black or Anita Cook, have talked about possible sort of lineage houses. Um, there's a lot of controversy about these about these houses and what they might mean, but the point is that instead of having these fairly um, small single nuclear family houses with external patios, now you have these these settlements that are much more like some of the house compounds, for example, for our Meso Mesoamerican co colleagues that they're used to, you know, around a, around a central patio or or just a few families living together. So instead of the nuclear family being the unit, the extended family now is now is a unit there. Um, you also have, these are some greenstone figures from a site called Piki uh, You also have lots of depictions of individuals that seem to be, um, whether they're lineage heads, whether they're, 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 you know, what they might be re representing, but there's a sense that you have individuals representing different, different factions, different, different groups within Mori society. So there's lots of different factions that are involved that seem to be linking to some of these, these lineage houses that were, that were shown in the, in, the, in the last slide. And then what worry is, is, is intriguing about is worry is made up um, in a little bit later periods, you've got a lot of these D-shaped uh, enclosures. Don't need to go into this in much detail, but this is sort of the ritual focus of, of uh, that site of worry. They're not huge spaces, they're not huge patios where the whole group comes together. Um, like in the Maya or, or, or Tiwanaku examples that people might be familiar with. These are fairly small spaces, maybe 100, maybe 200, maybe 300 people might be able to pack themselves into a place like this. But the idea is that, is that war society seems to be built around these, these nuggets that are not nuclear, but are not sort of collective uh, broadly across the entire city. It seems to be more along some sort of extended group that, that moves beyond the family, but not so far beyond the family. Okay, and you see in the tombs, you see a mix. You do see, still see the cysts, but you're seeing the first evidence for these collective burials. Collective burials also, you can see this type four right here. Uh, you can barely note it. There's a little tiny um, dashed line, but there, there are openings where you could actually feed the ancestors. ancestors. Uh, so they're interacting with these ancestors. They are oftentimes moving uh, some of these um, uh, uh, tomb coverings off so they can add more people into it. It's the kind of collective uh, tombs that are familiar uh, for when we were talking about Ayus um, about a thousand years later when we talk, when we look at uh, about Juan and Poma's uh, drawings. Okay, whoops. So in the middle horizon, so around 600 AD or so, so you have Siwas having just like I said, the very ephemeral settlements, everyone's buried in one place in these cis tombs. I should have mentioned that before. So cis tombs, everyone's in these single individual cis tombs in Cocopampa. Um, more influence starts spreading uh, down from that, cap that capital city into places like Nazca and along these routes. These are all, <coughs> excuse me, these are all red trails. Uh, the, uh, all these um, lines in red are trails that we've been able to map um, via satellite imagery. Uh, we're not sure when they date to. When we look at some of them, it's very clear that they date to at least late intermediate period. Oftentimes, some of these Ch Chiliwai, Ayoma, Toro Muerto, and Cacabamba have uh, rock art that dates to uh, the first millennium BC. So we know that a lot of these routes were used for a very long time. 
And these are the routes that uh, worry influence uh, moves through. Um, here's a vessel we excavated from Kotawazi, but it's just an example of some of this worry influence coming into that, into that region um, after 600 AD. Um, well, probably, or the first influence comes around uh, the end of the seventh uh, century. Okay, so here's Kilkabamba. Uh, it's a fairly small site. You can see it's no more than two hectares. Um, its uh, occupation is also fairly short, uh, probably something like a generation, um, maybe as much as 40 years, but probably closer to 20 years. If you look at the probability curves here, uh, this is based, I think it's on 30 some uh, radiocarbon dates. Uh, um, this is the, the Bayesian uh, chronology curve here. Um, and uh, we've divided that site into a variety of, of uh, components. Wouldn't worry too much about it, but there's a central, uh, there's a, that plaza and plaza component four. One, two, and three are these residential compounds, uh, larger residential compounds. And then we have five and six, which are um, organized in a different manner. I'm gonna, and that's what I'll be talking about uh, right now. Um, here's just a joint image of the residential area, and, uh, uh, the one, two, and three. Uh, and what I hope you get some sense, I, I perhaps should have put them side by side with the Conchapada lineage houses, but these have a similar feel. Architecturally, they, they, they look a lot like uh, uh, the Conchapada in terms of the plastering, in terms of the ramps, in terms of the stairs, in terms of some of those internal features, and the organization is fairly, is fairly similar. Uh, these are built as uh, for, for more than one nuclear family, and I'll show you some some clear examples in just a second through some analysis that we did there. Um, and also what we see is we see agents depicted. Remember I showed you those greenstone figures. Oftentimes what we have are um, uh, ceramics. We see these same, same agents uh, that, are, that are found in their art depicted here. And we can, what we see uh, in different parts of the site are different agents being depicted as if each one of those compounds is perhaps linking to, to particular uh, persons, either fictive or imagine whatever it might be, but you have agents that are that are sort of linking different um, different parts of the compounds together. Uh, and here you have this is uh, compound, uh, sorry, component six. These are you can see the main plaza right here. You can see in the middle there between the components uh, parts. You can see that's the the more worry uh, like like what the more stuff that looks like the Kutchapai, like some of the examples from from the Warrior Heartland, and um, the, the parts that, uh, that don't have the worry like architecture that, you know, uh, have uh, coastal ceramics, um, have a different kind of, kind of ceramics. Um, I don't have time to go into any detail. They also eat different things. They also um, prepare, uh, they have access to different obsidian sources. There's a number of lines of evidence that we've shown that, that the folks living in the worry compounds and, the, and those out, outside residential compounds live in very distinct ways. Um, and to drive that point home architecturally, because I'm going to focus on architecture for this, uh, you know, for, for this uh, talk, is this is just a view shed uh, analysis that uh, Giles Spence Morrow did for us. And um, you can see A is those worry compounds and B are the um, is uh, is the is the sort of external the more coastal architecture on the on the periphery of the site, and what's interesting here is you can see the blue basically says you can't you can't see it from outside, so you can see that in A it's just a block of blue that those residual compounds are very private, and the internal patios in those are very private because they're all faced by these these big uh, external walls. Versus in B, which is the coastal one, you get more of the feel of just houses that are private, individual nuclear family houses that are private with external patios that everyone can see, right? So there's, there's much more of a sense of individual families being uh, living next to each other versus A, you have a sense of a larger conglomerate of people being in these extended compounds and living in a, in a way that suggests that they think of themselves as bigger units. So A is a bigger units than B in terms of how they live their lives. Um, and this is really drawn, uh, driven home. Uh, once again, maybe hard to see the, the far right of the side there, but in terms of this is just, uh, once again, Giles was kind enough to do some of this, this work in the, in the, and you'll see it in the book that we, that we're, we're, that's coming out in a few months, um, which looking at, um, 
uh, basically looking at depth, uh, depth analysis and looking at uh, mean depth, uh, asymmetry, and some of these values. And, and I think it's fairly clear just by looking at it is that um, there's not a lot of depth in uh, on the left there, which is the which is the coastal. There's much more depth in in, in B, which is the uh, on the right, which is the um, which is the more worry like compounds. And so you have a sense that you are entering into these extended compounds, moving through these spaces are far more private, far more controlled than the, than the coastal. And what it suggests, at least to us, it's a very different mentality, very different idea about architecture. And it's an extended family architecture, so an extended group family uh, that, that fits much better with this idea of IU than, than does the coastal, um, way of doing things, which is the way in which people were living in this region prior to, um, to, to this middle rise in Amori contact. Okay, um, and, for, and from there as well, what we can do is, we, is, is if we look at the, the artifacts, here's Luisma doing, uh, looking at some of the, um, the uh, abandonment debris, as we go through and look through those and, and, and get some sense of some of the relationships in particular about some of the ceramics, for example, um, what you, what you begin to see, so for example, this is a this is a, a, a wonderful um, a wonderful piece that that was recovered. But we'll find pieces of the same ceramic recovered in different layers. Once again, it's only twenty years or so, maybe forty years of which this is occupied. But you have a sense that of memory. You have a sense of people uh, destroying a particular pot or, or ritually breaking a particular pot, and then coming back to that same place and putting another piece of that pot there. 20 years later. Okay, so there's continuity. There's sort of a sense of generational continuity in the worry compounds. Okay, so think of a house society um, a mentality is you're getting a sense of that through some of the reconstructions that we have this, of the ceramics. Um, and you see the same thing. These are these are called placas pintadas or uh, uh, painted painted plaques uh, in, in, in this part of, of Southern Peru. And we see the same sort of thing where uh, we have similar motifs that continue to be repeated um, and similar ways in which you're putting uh, some of these stones repeated uh, through time in particular in particular locations. Okay, so there's sort of an enduring sense of what this space is like, uh, you know, likely across, uh, you know, through a generation. And we don't see that same attention uh, in the in the coastal region, and uh, sorry, in the, in the in the in the peripheral area of the site, perhaps. Okay, so um, why I use take time to develop. Okay, so so then for a middle horizon example, we have this sort of sense is that is that um, Wari shows up. Uh, these folks are colonists from Wari is our uh, is our impression. They show up. They have coastal groups that are coming in with them, but. This is an area uh, in Siwash. You can see the Siwash Valley right now. It doesn't have a big population, doesn't have a big, big interest. And what, what you'll see right now is going to the later period, the next period after, is that the idea of IU doesn't, it doesn't click, right? The folks that came from Wari or the Wari heartland, they were living in that way for several generations. Right for about 200 years, they developed into those IUs. So they took that with them, that mentality, that that sort of idea. But there was none of that scalar stress that was pushing people in Siwas to do the same. And so in the Middle Horizon, IUs don't uh, aren't picked up by people living in the valley. Now they're going to get picked up at the very end later period, and we're going to get to that story now. So uh, later period sites, uh, it's probably circa around 1300 AD. So there's, that's important here. There's a hiatus. Um, so that uh, the site of Cucabamba is abandoned probably around 860, 870 AD. Uh, and then, then it's reoccupied around 1300 AD, maybe 1250 AD. Um, and it looks like it's a time where you have a similar a surge in residential sites across Siwas. Okay, and so when all of those tombs that were being used in the middle horizon and earlier are abandoned, and now all and now all the all the sites or residential sites are up there 
in the more arable region part of, of the valley, and all the dead are actually being buried next to the site. And we'll talk about that as we move as we move forward here. Um, and so here you have uh, uh, the Middle Horizon occupation of of uh, Cocobamba. You can see those two dotted lines are basically giving you the the outside edges of of um, of the site. That on the you'll see the river on the on the on the right there. On the left, you can see that's actually the, the border of the of the of the Pampa, although uh, it's the, the South Cemetery cuts uh, cuts over that a little bit, so it's not quite on the on the on the edge here. But um, what's, what's of interest here for us in this slide is a the site gets a whole lot bigger. It goes from about a little over two hectares to about seventy hectares in that later period, and that people are being buried on the extremes of that site for the most part, so that that the dead bracket the living at Kilcobamba in the late intermediate period. Uh, and the third thing is that middle horizon occupation is that there's no, there's no reoccupation except for the plaza. And I'll get to that in just a second. So they actually leave the middle of the site in ruins, even as they're, they're living um, in other places throughout the site. Okay, so um, this is just the, the radiocarbon uh, uh, dates. We have less radiocarbon dates for, for the LI uh, later minute period, uh, Kilcobamba, so there's more of a range, but more or less you see there's a hiatus, and then it's um, but, uh, sometime right before the Inca conquest, uh, it is abandoned. And indeed, we see we find no Inca shirts at, uh, at Kilcobamba. How do people live? Um, Unfortunately, a lot of the site has been eroded because people are living up on the, on the steep slopes. Places where we see uh, people living, we see uh, um, settlements like, uh, sorry, uh, households like this, which are fairly similar to, to what we saw on that Nazca slide of, uh, uh, um, earlier that I showed of just small family compounds. So as far as we know, people are, are living in small family compounds like they've lived for generations across Southern, southern Peru. Uh, and, and and as I said, they they they're going to be they're living all across all of the all of the um, if you can imagine all the hillside there um, that you would see would be full of houses and the foreground all that architecture would be sitting there and ruined. Uh, it was never reoccupied, um, although people did reoccupy and use the plaza uh, that's from where this uh, this picture is taken. And I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, and, but, and what they do in those ruins, they continue to, to worship in those ruins. They continue to place um, these, these placas pintadas. Uh, so uh, we see them uh, located often, often along the walls. So people seem to be moving through this space, uh, leaving these, these, these uh, stones with all these different decorations, oftentimes painted. The, the, the deck, they're oftentimes painted on one side and then they're stacked together. You can see the, the examples here. The examples on the left, are um, as they were found archaeologically. And then number two is when we unpack them to show you the colors and their associations um, to give you a sense of, of, uh, of, of, of how they were put together. Um, so like I said, you know, think about in terms of an individual, you now move to this, this city. Uh, city is probably too strong a term, but you move to this town. And um, now as you, uh, as you go to visit the plaza, you stop, you lay a few stones in the ruins and you go to the plaza and you, do feast and other kinds of events. And we have, you know, later period pottery and other things and uh, talking about some of the things that they may have done on that plaza. Um, and, and I should note too, and this is an, an, just another example of, of uh, some of this is a, a vidyake, uh, a big, a big jar. Um, the details of, and this is just, just giving you some sense of, of what that may have represented. I don't think it's that particular figure necessarily, but some sense of what may have been represented on that jar. Um, the point here is that the folks that went through that space probably had very little inkling about worry and very little inkling about where economics and what it might mean. But the ceramics were drastically different from anything that they, that they made or knew of. So there's a sense of sort of dissonance between the past and how they're living today. And they're moving, so they're moving through these ruins. They're, they're probably picking up some of these, these potsherds that look very different uh, from, from how they lived that, it, then. And they're also going by on the cliffs around Cucobampa. They're going by rock art 
that may predate even the even the Middle Horizon folks by by a thousand years, right? So it's just a place that's imbued with meaning, you know, imbued with ghosts, if you will, but ghosts with ghosts with meanings that you don't fully understand. Okay, so it has this sort of powerful nature to it, which I think is 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 going to be important to us. And so as people begin to so so then let's let's take us take us through 1300 AD for the first time there's lots and lots of people living in Siwas what does that do that causes resource stress that causes that scale of stress that I talked about about at the beginning people now have to find their relationships with things like water and land that before they didn't have to do um, and so in Kilkapamba, what you seem to do is you have all these people that begin that are doing two things. A, they're identifying with the plaza, they're identifying with the ruins of old Kilkapamba, they're identifying with Kilkapamba. That's they're kind of situating themselves around that place and claiming ancestry through their relationship to old Kilkapamba. And then they're also draping on a, on on in different places uh, on the north and south cemeteries. That, that's where they're placing their dead. But it's interesting here is that they're not placing their dead in collective tombs. They're still using cis tombs, right? They're not using extended family um, compounds. They're using nuclear family compounds. So the individual is still um, what is being emphasized here. But they're, they're, they're draping that individual around this sort of claim of this um, you know, primordial connection to place, which is, which is the ruins of old Kukupampa and the surrounding petroglyphs. Okay, so they're and they're so they're putting people into these and into these cyst tombs. Um, these this just a you know it's just a cylinder tomb here. It, it's just the size to fit an individual. You get some sense of it there in the image that I have. It's a collar tomb. Um, we have and I think the next do I have the next slide here? Yeah. So the next slide here shows you off what what we often find that what look like family plots. There'll be um, often not even a formal terrace, just a little ring of stones that 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 outlines a place and then you'll find different tombs there oftentimes we'll find uh, for example a uh, uh, a female a male and two children that might be buried there so there's a sense that these are individual family plots and they're all but they're all being buried at Kilkapamba along the margins of a site that's defining um, who we are versus other people that are outside of Kilkapamba right everything's facing old Kilkapamba and those ruins um, the ceramics from, from the South North C uh, cemeteries, I'm going to go into this in too much, but um, we do find distinctions between these cemeteries suggesting um, that uh, people are either coming from different places or making, uh, making alliances or making associations with people from, from the highlands, um, places like Wombo that are, that are uh, just up the river. So for the first time, really since the middle horizon here, 1300, 1400 AD, you start seeing not only more and more people at Kilkapamba, but increasing heterogeneity in ceramics and perhaps where people are coming from. Okay, so once again, more and more stress. People are trying to find themselves, to define themselves vis-a-vis -vis other, other folks. Um, and so uh, what this is what's happening around 1400 AD is people are defining themselves, but they're defining themselves not based on, not based on, on, um, excuse me, on, uh, they're not based on IU, but based on, on this sort of collective imagination of, oh, Kilkobam and the old ruins. This begins to change probably in the 15th century with the movement of people down from the, uh, from the coast, sorry, from the highlands to the coast as you get these really fairly complex societies in the highlands beginning to set up these, uh, these uh, lowland colonies and begin to move resources back and forth. They're sometimes called vertical archipelagos after the work of Murrah and folks like uh, Elermo Galdos Rodriguez uh, talks about some of this in his book. That's why I, I put this book out here, but talks about some of these communities being established. Uh, uh, and, and at least for me, I could talk about it more if you want in the Q&A uh, at, at the very end of the late intermediate period. Um, so you have these places seem to be very IU organized. They have collective tombs on places like Kolka, 
that are mixing everyone in the classic examples that uh, from like from that palm illustration, you have uh, larger family compounds, you have ceramics being utilized, you know, in different ways to, to sort of build these, 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 these IU relationships. The IU is, is up and running in Highland Arequipa, and it's still not in coastal Arequipa. Why is it in Highland Arequipa? At least in my mind, populations are bigger. There's more resource stress. People are trying to navigate these relationships. Um, and they're not newcomers. They've been here for a long time. And so they're starting to use ancestors to do that. They're using the IU to do that. Um, here's uh, Matt Velasco who's done a lot of work, for example, at uh, uh, Urakaka, um, and uh, you know, talks about the, the IU as a social force in, in places like Coke. And you see this throughout, throughout the Highlands. Um, you know, and looking at uh, cranial modification, once again, people using, uh, and, and the point just here is that people are using the ancestors, people are using uh, ancestral links. Say, I've been here for a long time. That's why I, I, this stuff belongs to me. Now flip back to CWAS, right? You can't do that in CWAS because the population aggregation, that heterogeneity, everything's happening so quickly. You can't make those ancestral claims in the same way because the situation is different in, in the Sea West Valley. Um, and so um, here I just, uh, uh, Lars's uh, um, uh, article here, I'm just pushing, uh, you know, putting out here because climate change, uh, climate change as well as surging uh, co complexity starts pushing people by, by, by the 14th century to move down into places like Siwas. Okay, so, what we see in places like Siwas at the very beginning is people are trying to navigate all these changes. The IU is not something that they're tending to use um, at the beginning, but then as you start to get these more formal migrations uh, later on to places like Quebrada de la Vaca uh, on the coast of Arequipa, you start having IUs coming and confronting people that are not organized uh, with, with IUs. And by the, by the 15th century, we see places like Hilcopampa being abandoned and then new settlements being placed that seem to be more IU organized. They're in part because of the confrontation that you're having between these corporate entities that are interacting and making claims that nuclear families are unable to do so in the same way. Um, okay, Sea West Valley. I'm not sure why I have that on there. Um, okay, so, so that more or less then, you know, is the, is the argument that a place that, that as you start getting more of these vertical archipelagos coming down that are IU organized, they're coming up against um, organizations that are not IU based, that are trying to sort of uh, pitch people together in different ways. So in this case in Copacabamba, it's around a shared sort of mythical past. But when you're in competition between the IU and this other kind of form, it seems that the IU wins out. And so you start seeing these IUs beginning to replace um, uh, uh, non-IU organizations in their keep at the very end of the later immediate period. And by the Incas, who are IU organized as well, it becomes even a, a bigger a bigger push of people that they can't compete without becoming more and more IU centered. Um, okay, so here's an example of, of uh, the, the um, Inca administrative center. And you can see, it's hard to see from the architecture, but the architecture, it's got, it, it, it's organized into these larger compounds. And they have the collective tombs. And we know from all, from rich ethnohistorical uh, uh, accounts that the IU uh, was, the, was the, you know, the building block of Inca society. Um, so this comes in then into, into, the, into the region after. Um, and, you know, so of course the competing IUs that, that made up the, the Panacas of, of you know, the Inca royal lines. Um, when 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 uh, the area was conquest uh, was conquered in the sometime in the 15th century, okay. So why rethinking the IU development matters. So just to conclude, um, and I think I just have this one slide, a sort of of, of um, fairly uh, dense writing here, but I've already gone a little bit further than I hoped. Um, so what I want to just do is say that that I think. Uh, I think in some ways it's, it's, it's important to think about IUs not as being uh, particularly special, that they're, 
they're a general category. If you think of them more of a general category, it's all about reacting to, so, to scalar stress. It's all about reacting to aggregation, to, to issues where, where you have uh, this change occurring. And without that scalar stress, without that, uh, that, that need for aggregation, without that sort of push, they're not likely to be developed. And if they do develop, they're unlikely to be sustained, right? There's, there's lots of issues about trying to do things together that if you don't need to do things together, these things tend to break apart. Okay, and we see that with middle rise and coca bamba. They're trying to create these, these relationships. It fails because there's not that scale of stress to sustain it. Um, alternatives exist, exist to, uh, um, to manage scalar stress. You know, we talk about Nazca as an example with slides, other sorts of things. Coca Bamba, we could talk a little bit about that. Um, but the important thing for me is that, that um, well, first off, all IUs aren't the same, right? And, and, and so that the middle horizon, the, the middle horizon worry IU is unlikely to be organized in the, in the same way as the Inca, and it's unlikely to be organized in the same way as the I use in Colca, is that they're all variation on a theme, but sometimes those small details matter in terms of the ways in which they, they make claims. And it'd be very interesting to do some studies, uh, once again, beyond this conversation about what happens when the, when the Arequipa I use organizations meet up with Inca organizations and how those, those interplay with each other over time. Um, but, the, the thing that I think is critical is that IUs actually work fairly well under scalar stress. And when they're pitted against other kinds of, 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 of organizations, they've tended to win, to, to win the battle. It seems not just simply through Inca conquest, but in, in the case with, with, the, with the IUs in the vertical archipelagos, is that when faced with a fairly well-organized intermediate unit that makes claims of territory in that way, you tend to have to become more IU-like in order to, to survive. So it'd be interesting to look, sort of look at some of these things and when IU start, start proliferating, how it might relate to scalar stress. Um, and so then finally, just to end my, my last point, um, the IU as, as, as constructed um, at the time of the Spanish conquest may be largely a product of the Inca expansion, right? So the sense of IU as we see it is probably the last iteration of several different kinds of IUs. But of course it begins, it takes over both as Inca conquest and the Spanish try to reconceptualize how things work. It becomes the IU that's, we're sort of, uh, that we sort of live with. Um, so those are some of my, my thoughts here. Uh, once again, to thank my uh, uh, colleagues and you know, uh, thank everyone for, uh, for, for listening and appreciate it. Perfect. I think I am. Um... I should stop sharing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Great. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Justin. That was wonderful. So we have a couple of members with us here on uh, on the Zoom meeting. So if there's sure. anyone that would like to ask Justin a message directly, you can do that. You're more than welcome to turn on your, your video and audio, or you can write out your question in the chat box. Um, and we can uh, we can get rolling with the questions. And same for those of you that are listening in on Facebook, feel free to type your question in the chat and then we can read it out to Justin for you. So I don't see any questions yet, but uh, I'm sure Amadeo has a few since he was <laughs> next to you. I'll put you on the spot. <laughs> That's, that's, that's how it yeah. works. Okay. He <laughs> is right. our resident Andeanist in the society. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was interested in the, well, if you were able to get a sense of the relationship between the Wari population and the coastal population, you know, if you saw like Wari ceramics uh, within the coastal compounds and things like this, or if these uh, Wari people might have been coastal people that adopted Wari ceramics or yeah, I was interested in these kind of things. And yeah, relationship. sure. The the you know in general, what happens in in um, middle in, in Mori sites is that they're fairly they're fairly clean sites, and that what we end up getting is oftentimes not so much a uh, what we get most of are, are the the last things that people did. So the the worry is you're probably where it's fairly you know. Uh, involved um, rituals when they um, when they abandoned a site. So we, we've got them smashing ceramics, and they're actually 
taking uh, ceramics and they're and they're scattering it as they as they move through the site as and as they leave. And we can track people as they move from room to room because of that. Um, but uh, in regards to ceramics, for example, what happens? It seems we found very little ceramics in the um, in 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 the sort of coastal sort of the, you know the 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 the, the non moori part of the site even though we found just as many lithics. And what we suspect they may have been doing is actually taking their pots at the end of the, uh, you know, during these different rituals and breaking them as well. So they actually would go to the, to the worry section uh, of the site and participate in those ceremonies. So we don't get a lot of the ceramics, but the ceramics that we do, it's all, it's all uh, non worry uh, There seem to be um, you know, a sense that these are likely objects that, that won't be exchanged. These are our objects. You know, this is part of, you know, you may, you may be a part of the, of the rituals, but we're not going to go ahead and share those ceramics. It's not being, there's not like a prestige good exchange sort of model that seems to be going on here. What, what we do kind of get there is just this, this extreme effort and, you know, um, Alexa, Alexa, Lake, uh, uh, you know, Alexa, Patty, Matt, and, 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 and Mallory, some of the people that worked on our project could talk more about it from a paleo bot and a funnel perspective. But it's, it's the, the, the worry people working very hard to create relationships. They did a lot of feasting. They did a lot, a lot of work in order to try to draw people in. Um, and what we're kind of imagining in some ways is they're trying to create IU-like relationships. They're trying to, they're trying to, to, to do something that was foreign to that particular population, which was, you know, through all these fees, create these, you know, create these sort of intermediate units um, that didn't really exist. You know, you have a sense in these places of sort of village-wide identities and sort of individual nuclear family identities, but that, inter inter that intermediate identity, which was so important in Mesoamerican as well as an Andean sort of complexized later on, that it doesn't exist yet, at least that's, that's, that's what I'm sort of pushing for this area and they're trying to create it and they're working very hard to create it. And it ultimately fails because they, they leave the site. They basically pull up stakes. They, 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 they you know, they, they may have, uh, you know, even we have uh, some shafts that may be shaft tombs and it looks like they may even take their mummy bundles and, and, and filled it back in. They just said, okay, we can't do it. You know, and they moved to move somewhere else. And, and you never know why, why they left. But I think one of the reasons may have been that they, that they failed to fail to create those kind of relationships that were so integral to their lives in a, in a place like Ayacucho in the Wari Heartland, where there was a much denser population and a tradition of doing things in that way. Yeah, thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you. We've also just got a couple of compliments. Ah, <laughs> compliments, okay. Yeah, Lorraine. Well, that, 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 can't, can't, okay. I can't really go with that though. <laughs> Lorraine always says great, uh, Lorraine says great talk, thanks. And then uh, Fabiola on Zoom says, thank you, great talk. Uh, Chris says, thanks a lot for a very enlightening discussion about I use in Peru. So there you go. So just a couple of compliments for you. So no other questions yet. So um, I, I'm not an Andeanist. I work in the Mesoamerican region, but I was really intrigued by the ceramics that you were talking about. And you called the, the representation on them agents. And you had an image, I think it said agent number 152. Um, and I'm wondering, is, is that sort of a numbering system that has been created to um, to talk about the different representations because you talk about them in the greenstone as well these agents these maybe these lineage heads and is this a system that's been created to try and differentiate between these representations on the ceramics is, is there a is there a way to do that and say you know we think we're seeing at least 50 different agents uh, i was just I was curious about that. Sure, sure, yeah, no, and, and this, you know, this, this, the, this presentation, of course, builds on on the on the backs of a lot of a lot of uh, other people's work, and, and of course, taking it probably in ways that they don't quite, you know, probably, you know, um, you know, maybe get some emails that are less kind, you know, uh, <laughs> and per, you know, but the but Pat Knobloch uh, has done uh, years of work, and she's got a database, so who's who in middle pri middle rise in Peru, and she looks at these different. Um, different depictions in this case looks at things like um, headgear, uh, facial tattoos. It's interesting, it's, we don't necessarily have portraiture among Wari in that they, that, that, for example, the Moche and some other examples of, of, of other, where, where they're, they're like showing a person's face as an individual, you know, the features, they look old or they, you know, arthritis, whatever it might be. The faces are all the same. It's all the same sort of mold, but then they decorate them differently. 
And so she's identified these different different sort of faces and then done biographies for them. And so you do see, it's interesting that the, the, the greenstone, the figures are different, but in terms of the metalwork, the textiles and ceramics, you see the same folks cropping up. And I have done some work with, uh, with her and, and Elizabeth Gibbon, uh, trying to do a little bit of network analysis, trying to sort of track these folks um, over, uh, you know, through the Andes. And, and what we do find is, yeah, that we can, we can sort of trace the agents that are at Kilkabama, we can actually look at where they're coming from. And so our sense is that they're coming from, this won't mean so much if you, you don't do, do, do the Andes, but from the warrior heartland, into Nazca and then, then across the coast, we can actually trace the same figures. And she's been doing some stuff with biographies. And so, so once again, it, it, it's, it's difficult because you know, what do these represent? Do they represent you know, uh, mythical heroes, real individuals or, or you know, whatever it might be um, is unclear. Uh, in some ways, the, the, these, these agents are sort of more popular in the, in the first part of the Middle Horizon and the second part of the Middle Horizon. They may speak to a sort of a more heterarchical, if you want to want to use that term, sort of a uh, 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 worry state beginning than, than an end state beginning. But what we do see is that is that people seem to be associating themselves with certain agents, and so you have certain sites that seem to that 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 seem to feature some agents and not and not others. And then we also can look at the relationship between those those agents on particular pots where you have multiple ones, and sometimes you have them as captives. You know, so similar to to the, you know, um, the, the Maya stuff we're looking at, um, some of the networks and, and how kings start moving around a little bit. We're doing a little bit of that with the Andes, but of course we don't have the the, the name. So it is a little bit, you know, uh, you know, Agent 154, and there's sometimes there's a pushback of, you know, how do you know this is this person, or, you know, this, et cetera, but going with, 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 with her knowledge, that's what you get this sort of sense. And from an IU perspective, then you can see, you know, IUs are about fictive, you know, you know they, they trace themselves back to, a, to oftentimes a fictive kin. So you can see this would be a powerful way for you to do that by having this, this ancestral sort of uh, notion. And you don't necessarily see that, for example, something like Nazca, you, you, you know, you see, you know, think about the Nazca lines. Those aren't really people represented, right? They're not trying to go back next door to a fictive ancestor. Now, maybe we, we can't conceptualize it correctly, but it's, they're, they're very dramatically different in the way in which they're sort of organizing um, their, their, their outlooks, at least in my opinion. Awesome. That's great. Yeah, that's interesting. It's kind of portraiture and art is always so intriguing. So it's really interesting to hear about the way that they're, they're trying to kind of go about doing that. So it sounds like there's some really kind of, you know, interesting clues there with it, which is great. Um, so we, we have another question from uh, Julia L. And she says, fascinating talk, Justin. Thanks so much for this. I was just wondering if you could talk a bit more about how some of these other groups in this region were organized. You mentioned possibly a nuclear family organization. I also wanted to ask, do you see the Inca trying to create um, IU-like relationships or organizations in a similar way to the Wari? So it's a long question, but if you want to see it, it's in the, it's in the chat box. <laughs> sure, yeah, no, that, that's that's a nice thing about uh, about doing this on Zoom. We can actually look at the question. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, so there's sort of two parts to that question. One, um, you know, the, the you know, unfortunately, in the end, well, in any region, there's places that have been, there's been a lot of work done in places where there's very little work done. Um, you know, we know the most about Maquegua and Nazca. That's why I sort of uh, looked at those and other places we almost know nothing about, you know, the, the era before the middle horizon. But, you know, what we're getting at, especially outside of Nazca and places like Maquegua that are very similar, I think, are, are more similar to, to what we may have had in was very small settlements, you know, small settlements of saying, you know, 50 people, 100 people max, farmers. Um, the, the, the IU, at least in my mind, doesn't really, the IU isn't really necessary in those kinds of relations, in those kinds of, of settings, and it doesn't seem to develop in those settings. And so what we, we instead presume is that we have individual households, you know, interacting with the with households at, on a one-to-one on a -one basis without going up to the higher IU level. Um, we don't have the kinds of, you know, uh, and, but what we do see, for example, we talk about settlement organizations that seem to reflect um, divisions that 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 are above that are that are above the nuclear family level and below the sort of site wide level. We actually get that when Tiwanaku moves into Makegua, 
um, where you start, you do start seeing those neighborhood divides, right? So this sort of sense of neighborhood, because neighborhood I think feeds into sort of this IU and, and you do have, you know, once again, it's, it's it, was it the couple? I mean, the same sort of thing you have in Mesoamerica. Oh yeah, don't use that word. You know, so IU, how far do you want to throw around that word? But in terms of intermediate social units, we only really see those, at least in my mind, in Southern Peru, when you're when they're being introduced from places that had a lot more of that scalar stress, that complexity, that heterogeneity, and they're dealing with it. And then they import those organizations with them as they come. But then those they don't really stick. The Warakani, the local people, Makegua, they don't really pick it up, right? Because it's not useful to them. It's not useful in that setting. These people are just you know coming in because that's the way that they think. That's their organization. Um, Oh gosh, you know, I talked too much. Now I need to find this. Okay, what is this? You see the Inca. So um, yeah, and so the the and then the issue with the Inca. So that's an interesting question with the with the with the Inca, where um, you know the the Inca are coming into these regions and um, have a certain you know they have a, a you know as you may know from Inca, for example, they have this decimal organization that they begin to set up. And this decimal organization is based on the on the on the very premise that you'll be able to have, um, you know, bigger groups speaking for smaller groups. And you can sort of, you know, Russian doll it larger and larger. So there's a, there's a sense of that the way in which we're going to organize things is by building off of this IU that we understand and then making larger and larger groups. So that, um, so the, yes, by the way in which they're trying to administer these lands and trying to, you know, create these labor taxes and interact with people, they're demanding are, are they encouraging a certain kind of social organization? And so the IU organization that's, that's, that, that's, that's um, you know, uh, that's already been introduced in places like Arequipa then begins to, 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 to develop. And so you'll see, you know, for example, um, uh, Jacob Bongers has done some great work with his dissertation in the, in the Chichiba, I think it was, and looking at introdu introduction of, uh, of these, um, collective tombs and they're happening with the Incas. And it seems to be that it's part of, of making these claims in the, in the Inca vernacular in ways that, that can be understood in the late horizon. And in order to do that, you need to speak, speak in Ayu, if you will, you need to speak a certain way. So I think that does then push people to live in that, in that kind of, kind of uh, uh, mechanism. Perfect. Thanks, Justin. Um, and, and Matt's just actually shared a link to a paper about settlement scaling in uh, actually in Mesoamerica. Oh, OK. There we go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll read what you do. Um, so I don't see any other questions, but maybe I'll wait a few more seconds. But I think we've probably kept you long enough for this afternoon, Justin. So, yeah, if there aren't any questions that come in in the next few seconds, I think we'll probably say thank you so much to Justin <laughs> for taking the okay. time to speak with oh, us no, today. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having um, really me. really appreciate it. And yeah, we'll look forward to Matt's paper. Yeah, no, there's, yeah. there is some incredible scaling stuff. And that's, and that is where, you know, in, you know maybe a last word if I could give that to, to no question answered, but you know, that's where I do think, um, you know, it, it is interesting then to do a little bit of compare, comparative look to look at how some of these more intermediate social organizations develop in Mesoamerica and compare them to places like the like the like the IU, right? So that when and and I think the danger is um, the danger sometimes is that we think of these things distinctly Andean or distinctly Mesoamerican. If we pull back a bit and think of them as part of a general pattern, then we can begin to compare them. I think it's very interesting ways. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again, Justin. And we will have this talk available on YouTube if anyone wants to uh, share it with anyone that wasn't able to make it today. So thanks so much again, Justin. All right. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye bye. All right. So.